we are going to be talking about cell membranes. So these are the outside part of a cell. It's kind of the thing that keeps the cell a cell. It keeps the things that are inside inside so that the outside can't get in unless it's supposed to. Okay, and so you're anytime you have anything involving cells, you're going to have to have some kind of an internal environment and that will often differ from their external environment. And so the cell membrane is pretty integral to preventing your outside from spilling into your inside or vice versa. Okay, so cell membranes are what we call selectively permeable, and that sounds really fancy, but we're going to break it down and make it sound nice and easy. And that's all due to their structure, the structure of the membrane. Okay, so what I want you to imagine here is just a cell, so that's what's going on right here. And really a cell has an outside part and an inside part. Okay, so inside of the cell, that's where things are going to be happening, right? Whatever the cell is supposed to do, that is pretty much all going to happen inside for, our, for the purposes of our class. Now, the outside part is going to consist of these little pieces. Okay, so this is kind of a simplified cross-section of a cell membrane. All right, so I want you to picture cell membranes as being really two sides forming one, almost like a railroad track. Okay, and they are made up of phospholipids. So each of these, if I get my pen out here, each of these is a phospholipid. Okay, And so you'll notice that there's always two phospholipids next to each other. And we have the green tail-like part next to the green tail-like part of the next one, and the heads are kind of separate from one another. Okay, the reason this is called a bilayer is because it's made up of two parts, two layers, one, two, of those phospholipids. So sometimes you'll see it referred to as a phospholipid bilayer, as well as a cell membrane, saying the same thing for the purposes of this class. Okay. So these phospholipids, so what I'm doing is I'm just zooming in on one of these phospholipids right here, one of the things I circled before. Okay. And I'm just looking at the two different parts. So over on the right here, I have the head, and I have the tails. So the head are called hydrophilic, and if you recall from chapter three, hydrophilic means that they like water, okay? That means that they can dissolve in water, whereas the tails are hydrophobic, okay? So they are water-fearing, or they do not like water. Okay? Because these are all one molecule, they have two distinct parts, right? One is hydrophilic, one is hydrophobic, so we call that amphipathic. Okay, so phospholipids are known as amphipathic. You do not need to memorize that term, but you should be familiar with the fact that these phospholipids have two distinct parts, and that, is, that structure is integral to their function. Okay, without this structure, these would not work as we know them. I don't need you to memorize all of these chemical formulas, anything like that. Okay, really, this right here is all you need to see, and then just understand that it is, of course, more complex than that. Okay. Now, remember that water is going to be important to all organisms. It's going to be part of the cytosol. Okay. It's going to be a part of the environment to a lot of organisms. So, when you put phospholipids, remember that's our with our head and tails, if we put those in the water, they're going to automatically form this shape. Okay. So this is the bilayer shape. It's going to do that by itself. It wants to do that. The reason it wants to do that is because the heads want to be near water and the tails want to be away from water. And so they're going to orient themselves so that only the heads touch the water, and the water in this case is on either side, okay? and only the tails are going to stay away from the water. And how are they going to do that? Well, they're going to squish in this tight space between the heads. Okay, so they're trying to stay away from the water as best they can. And this is going to be really, really important for this entire chapter. Okay, so for this first lecture, I'm just gonna be talking about the membrane structure, and then the, in the next lecture, we're gonna be talking about membrane transport, so how things move. Okay. Now, just remember that these phospholipid bilayers have two distinct parts, okay? and if you were to diagram them, I would really wanna hammer in that this is way more complex than we ever draw in these simple diagrams. So if I ever had you draw a phospholipid bilayer, this right here, this bottom picture, is totally acceptable. That's what I want you to draw. I just want you to understand that, of course, these things are molecules, and they're made up of atoms, and all of that is going on here in this right picture.
Okay, it's much more complex. Now, when you actually look at a microscope image of a bilayer, it looks very different, right? So this is kind of the best we can do uh, in terms of visualizing it. And so if you zoom in that little separated part there, that little white layer between the exterior and the cytosol. So remember the cytosol is the inside of the cell, the exterior is the outside of the cell, whatever that is in this case. Okay, you're gonna have that bilayer. So it's really separating the inside, excuse me, the inside from the outside. Okay. This lets you do different things inside that you can't do outside and vice versa. Okay, really without this cell, or excuse me, without this membrane, you wouldn't have a cell, right? <clears throat> you can't have a circle without having the outline, okay? So, your book talks about a few different models of cells, and really the only one that you need to know about is the fluid mosaic model. Okay? So, I need you to picture the bilayer as a fluid. They're not actually bound together, they just like to hang out. Okay? So there's no covalent bond linking these two phospholipids, or these two. They just like to be there, not even these two. Okay? It's not that they have covalent bonds that are absolute and you can't break them very easily. No, it's actually just they happen to like each other enough. And so if you disturb the cell enough, you can break those bonds, okay? excuse me, those attractions, and then you might disrupt your cell membrane. Okay. <clears throat> now, cell membranes are so important because you can actually kind of shove things in there. So like I just said, there's no real bonds here holding these tails together. So with enough maneuvering, I can really shove a protein to be part of the membrane. So right here I have this big purple protein, and it's part of the membrane because it spans both sides of it. Okay, and that's going to become really important as we talk about membrane transport. But for now, I just want you to get used to the idea of membranes containing things that are both inside the cell and outside the cell, maybe at the same time. Maybe you have things that don't span. So if you look at this green part here, it spans both parts of the cell. It's kind of linking the inside to the outside. But maybe this one doesn't link all the way. Maybe it's just on the outside. You really need to get familiar with that idea. Okay, and then here's a more schematic basic view of this. Okay, so your book will talk about glycoproteins and glycolipids that are going to have carbohydrates attached and they're often going to be used to tag a cell, maybe to represent it as being this kind of cell. So maybe something in your body can read this glycoprotein right here and say, oh, this is a blood cell or whatever it is. Okay, so it's just something on the outside. Generally, when something's on the outside of a cell, it's because it's trying to communicate in some way with another thing outside of the cell. Okay? Now, as I said, you have these proteins that are embedded into the membrane sometimes. So that's what's going on right here in the upper right. I have a protein that is embedded, and on that protein, I have a receptor. Okay, so this is an area of the protein right, that can accept something. It can bind to something. So in this case, in this diagram, I have epinephrine binding to this receptor. So there's a spot on here on this protein that only epinephrine can bind onto. Nothing else, for the purposes of right now, can bind onto this spot. Okay? So only epinephrine is going to bind here. And then that's going to cause something to happen. Okay? So in this case, it's going to have GTP change into GDP and then something's gonna happen down here. Don't worry about all that right now, we're gonna to get to it. But I just want you to be familiar with the idea that I have these proteins that span these membranes sometimes, and sometimes things can bind on, so like hormones. So epinephrine is a hormone, okay? So they have hormone binding sites. You don't need to memorize that, you just need to understand it, okay? Now there's also a thing that we need to talk about very briefly called cell adhesion. Okay, and so this will basically be cells connecting to one another. Sometimes this is really important if you have something that needs to be watertight. Okay, so you don't want your blood vessels, which are made up of lots of cells, to have water leaking out of them, right? You don't want blood to just leak out wherever. So there needs to be some connection. And so sometimes you're gonna have two cells. So, sorry, you're gonna have two cells. So I'm gonna draw one bilayer. Blah, blah, blah. 
again, very basic. Here's one cell, etc. Okay. And then if I had another cell nearby, because you're part of a larger organism, right? And multicellular organism. Whoops. Okay. So here's two cells. Here's cell one and cell two. Okay. Maybe there's something connecting them here. Okay. Maybe it's holding them together so that they're nice and watertight. <clears throat> I really want you to just think about how cells communicate for now. So when you have two cells right next to each other, or even when they're not right next to each other, they need to be communicating because maybe cell one needs to know that cell two already has the resources it needs, right? Multicellular organisms have trillions of cells sometimes. So you need to be able to talk to one another. And I just want you to start thinking about that. I don't need you to memorize any of this terminology or any of that at this point, I just want you to recognize that cells talk to one another. Okay. Now, we're gonna talk more about this as we talk about membrane transport, but just to kinda, as a primer, here I wanna talk about passive transport and active. So when something is active, you typically think of like working out or something like that. So that's going to require some energy. Okay, so any kind of active transport is requiring energy. Okay, this is energy and transport is moving stuff, all right? So if I am moving something and I have to use energy to move that thing, I'm gonna classify that as active transport. And that might sound kind of vague right now, but it'll make a lot more sense after we talk about membrane transport more specifically. Passive transport is the exact opposite. It's stuff moving, but you don't need to add any energy to the system. So up here you have a little dot, it's just a little particle for now, and it's gonna move down here because it wants to move down there. And so it's gonna do that without any extra energy. Right here I just have a channel. It's just like an open little hole that lets things from the outside get inside. Okay? Whereas down here, I have to actually pump stuff from the outside into the inside. And again, we will talk about this a lot, so don't worry about it yet. Okay? Here are just some different membrane protein types. I do not need you to memorize these. However, I do want you to be able to differentiate between passive and active transport. Okay? And then again, think about the fact that cells need to communicate with one another okay? and how they might do that through hormone binding sites, immobilized enzymes, cell adhesion, et cetera. Okay? So proteins aren't the only things that can be a part of cell membranes. So can cholesterol, and I have molecules misspelled here, whoops but cholesterol can be a part of your cell membrane. And cholesterol is mostly hydrophobic, so it's typically going to hang out with the tails of the phospholipids. That's what's going on here. Uh, now, in mammal ugh, excuse me, mammalian membranes, so mammals, that cholesterol is going to kind of stop the membrane from being so fluid. So if you think of the membrane as kind of being like the surface of water, it kind of likes to stick together, right? It has that surface tension, but with enough force you can break it. Well, the cholesterol kind of stops that. It makes it harder to break it. Okay, so that kind of keeps the membrane together. And you don't need to memorize that per se. Just understand that there's a lot more going on here than just the phospholipids. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, the phospholipid structure makes it actually really hard for most things to get in or out. And that's actually really good for the cell. It helps keep the outside outside and the inside inside. Okay, so that makes it a really effective barrier. That kind of allows the cell to control what can come in and what can go out through other means. So I want you to picture this membrane as being relatively hard to pass through. Okay, and remember, it has that cholesterol. It makes it kind of sticky, right? It makes it more solid. So we give this terminology of selective permeability, or we say that phospholipids are selectively permeable. And basically, if you think about selectively, you are making a selection, okay? so you're choosing. And permeable means to pass through. So if you are selectively permeable, that means you are letting some things, whatever you choose, to pass through. Okay? That's kind of how I want you to picture this. So it's easier for smaller nonpolar molecules to make it through the membrane. So here we have the outside of a cell, and here we have the inside. Okay. 
And it's easier for smaller nonpolar things to make it through because you can kind of think of that center area where the, those nonpolar tails are as being really, really hard for polar things to get through. Okay. So small nonpolar things can get through fairly easily, whereas large polar or ionic, so these are ionic are of course charged and polar are partially charged molecules, can't get to can't get through as easily. So stuff like oxygen, carbon dioxide, other small nonpolar things can make it through. Some water molecules will also make it through, and we're going to talk about that more later. But big things like glucose or some polar water-soluble molecules, straight up ions like sodium ions, potassium ions, those things can't get through by themselves. In order to allow certain things through, you need to have channels. So what I have here is what's called an aquaporin. An aquaporin, let's think about that word, aqua means water, and pore, like a pore in your skin, is just a hole. Okay, so this is just a hole in a cell that lets water through. So this lets water go in and out. Okay, this allows the cell to control how big it is and how much water is in it. Uh, it can let water out or let water in, depending on a number of factors. But the water has a really hard time getting through this part of the cell membrane. So we have this channel to make it easier for it. Look how many I can get through. Right? These guys have a really hard time getting through here quickly. Okay. Now, some organisms will have a cell wall outside of their cell membrane. Okay, so you have your little phospholipid bilayer. I'm going to try and draw this quickly. Okay, so I have, imagine these are just two tails. So it's like this and like this, but I just kind of connected them. Okay. So I have a cell here. And on the outside, I have built a cell wall around. Okay, and that can be for a number of reasons. Usually it's going to be for structure, but sometimes it is for even more protection. It really just depends on the species. And that just makes it more rigid and makes it harder for stuff to get in and out. Okay. I don't need you to memorize any types of cell walls or anything of that nature right now. I just want you to start thinking of it as another hurdle that cells have to get past. Okay. Now, one thing that you might not realize is that prokaryotic cells, so like bacterial cells, do have a cell wall, just like plant cells do, but they're different cell walls. I don't need you to memorize the types. I don't need you to, to differentiate between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Just understand that there's some diversity here. Okay. <clears throat> now, that's going to leave us with the end of membrane structure. And we're going to move on to membrane transport next, which is really the bulk of chapter 7.